Good afternoon. Welcome to the Theotrade Afternoon Video. I'm Blake Young. Today is November 9th, 2023, and today we're going to be talking about the market being freaked out by the Fed. There's two key things that are attached to the Fed that happened today that did cause this sell-off, this panic even, in the markets. And the number one thing we're going to talk about is bonds, the bond auction specifically. We have the 30-year bond auction, and you can see that we had a sizable down day today. If you look at the percentage down today, it's down 1.5%. That's one of the largest single-day downs that we've had on the chart. But this sell-off is more significant because it's not just a big down day and possibly rolling over to go back and retest the lows. The bond futures sold off because the bond auction performed terribly. And what do we look at in conjunction with that? The bond auction is set up in a way that they offer the bonds at a specific yield. And then they say, who wants it? So let's take a look at the data. First, we're going to look at these two numbers. There's two numbers here. One is the yield that they offer the new bonds at, and then how many people were willing to buy it. And you'll note the first one is 4.77, the second one is 2.2. Both of those numbers are lower. So we did offer a lower yield, but that's due in part because prices have rallied over the last couple of weeks. The fact that we had 2.2 bid to cover, that's telling you how many offers they got to, how many people were willing to buy it really at these offered rates. Now that is the lowest number. That 2.2 is the lowest number we've had in a very long time. In fact, I couldn't find one that was showing a bid to cover lower than 2.2, at least in the recent history. And then that lower yield was a concern as well. So they're offering these bonds and saying, here's what we can offer. And no one was interested in them. No one picked them up. In fact, it is so bad, we can see that this data here, this is what they call the 30 year stop through trail. And so we're looking at 30 year bonds and the stop through trail. And you can think of this like a normal bond, or excuse me, another normal auction, where you might say, hey, we have this painting going for this, let's start the bidding at, right? That's kind of the idea. And so they start the auction, say, let's start the bidding at, and here's the yield. They had to lower the price to the lowest level or lowest difference from the average price, the lowest difference from the initial offering price, more in this auction than they have in history, at least as far back as we could go. So what we're seeing is there's so little demand for those bonds that they had to lower the price, lower the price, lower the price. And, and can, you can imagine the embarrassment or the, the uncertainty that that causes. They say, hey, we want to start this auction by offering this painting for $10,000 and no one raises their hand. They say, how about nine, eight, seven, six? It gets to the point and say, look, we will pay your buy your lunch every day for the next month if you buy this painting for 5000 And so the lowering, lowering of the price is showing a, a bit of desperateness to be able to get those bonds sold off, but is showing you the demand. Now, in addition to that, we know that we're lacking in demand. We saw the worst foreign purchases, one of the worst foreign purchases of bonds in decades. And so we're looking at these sell-off here, and it's not only that we are seeing lower demand, but Primarily that demand decline or that drop in demand is from foreign investors, which is the, the main bloodline for U.S. bonds. So if we continue to sell off, not only can we get to these lows at 108 and 107, but remember we have to issue new treasury debt as well. We have about a trillion plus in treasury debt that has to be issued new just to meet the government's current budget needs. In addition to that, we have a bunch of debt that is expiring or renewing or being refinanced by offering them again. And we're looking about three, three and a half trillion dollars worth of debt. So almost 10%. So if we had 10% supply when we have no demand already, I think we'd easily get through the low and break through that low and continue to slide. Now we look at the ZN, the shorter time frame, the 10 year and the difference there. And we rolled over here, not as aggressive as sell-off, but you can see we sold off at these key levels and we could be looking at a drop down to these lows. Now, if we see the drop to these lows, not only should we see the 10-year treasury push back up to their recent highs, I still have 5.3 and 6% on my target. If we don't create a head and shoulders, which it could, it could still happen, we could create a head and shoulders and reverse through here, but I'm still thinking that with this shift in demand in bonds, we could easily get back up to 5% go to 5.3%, go back to the 20 some year highs and see these yields get to six and a half, almost 7%. Now, if a 10 year yield gets to 7%, you should expect nine 
and 9.5% mortgage rates. And what will that do? It'll crush the real estate market. Have we already seen that? Yes, we have. Let's take a look. Now, this is still on the max we can go back. So when we're looking at this real estate ETF, doesn't go back that far. It doesn't go back to 2007, 2008. But I want you to note that from the peak in December of 21, we've erased all the growth as of last month. We were at and near the lowest level we've been, including the pandemic or going back to the pandemic. And then you can see that's kind of a key level back through here. So we, we've erased all of that as far as real estate goes, and yet prices haven't come down as much as they could or should. We should be seeing real estate prices get back to what it was in 2016, 17, 18. Now for the second part, we want to go look at the Fed statement or the FOMC statement from the Fed chair, Jerome Powell. And there's a lot that was said in the opening. There's a lot that was said throughout, but there's a couple of key things that I want to highlight and kind of frightening. If we look here, the Federal Open Market Committee is committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restricted to bring inflation down to 2% over time. Fine, we already knew that, but here's the scary part. We are not confident that we have achieved such a stance. We know that the ongoing process towards a 2% goal is not assured. Inflation has given us a few head fakes. And I read those three statements all in one weird sentence that we are not confident that we've reached that. We don't even know if we've reached it. But we're not assured that we're even going to reach our goal, and we've been faked out by inflation. And then they said, if it becomes appropriate to tighten policy further, we will not hesitate to do so. And that kind of seems like they're talking it back a little bit. But if we look down a little lower, you'll see it says, going forward, it may be that a greater share of the progress in reducing inflation will have to come from the tight monetary policy restraining the growth of aggregate demand. They're admitting that the supply stuff is not really the issue. They have to keep adjusting monetary policy to crush demand. And we want to keep in mind that we've talked about this, M2, money supply, what's available in cash and deposits, has seen the most significant restrictive move in history. And this is billions and hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars coming off the table in monetary policy. So this is some of the most restrictive stance already, and they're saying that we have to do more restrictive stance to be able to get inflation under control. And once again, keep in mind that they have to restrict while still putting that new debt on the table. This creates a real problem. Now, if we take a look at the sectors, these are the sector ETFs being compared to the S&P 500 and simply looking back one quarter. And I like to use one quarter because I believe it is somewhat of a substitute for GDP. And if we look at this, there's only two sectors that have stayed above 0%. That is XLK, technology, and XLC, communications, which is also technology. So the technology world is the only thing that has kept the broad market afloat. They have been up 0.28% for a quarter, which is with 2% inflation is a loss and 4% for the quarter when technology is concerned. But those two, if you took those out, were already negative for the S&P 500. If you take those two out, which are very heavily weighted into the S&P 500, we're looking probably closer to 3 4 5% down for the quarter. And if we look at the worst performing, well, it should come as no surprise that that's real estate. Real estate is taking the biggest hit as we continue to raise rates and we've seen higher borrowing costs. Borrowing costs like we'd said, are going to likely continue to go higher if bonds continue to go lower. Real estate is likely to continue to go lower and even break through that key support level. If we look at home builders during the same time frame, we've come way off the highs, but we've bounced sharply and pushed back up to this near-term high. A lot of people believe that we are in a supply crunch, that we don't have enough homes. Well, how is it that we don't have enough homes? Reality is that we don't have enough homes for sale. It's not that there aren't enough homes, there are just not enough homes for sale. And these higher interest rates are going to keep that restrictive behavior on supply, and which is propping up home builders. But if those interest rates are going to be at 5%, 6%, and therefore lending rates are going to be at 8%, 9% over the next couple of years, home builders are going to have a harder time selling homes or building homes for a price that they can make the same margins on and I expect home builders to fall back and not only test 74 but probably go to 71 and possibly clear those lows. I'm going to drop from 80 current price down to 73 
is going to be 72 is going to be another 10 percent drop in home builders again and they rallied off of the lower interest rates and they only dipped off the higher interest rates and the sell-off of bonds today we're not done bond prices are likely going to continue to slide and if that's the case yields are going to go up and home builders are going to have pressure placed on them to push them all the way back down to these lows now i already covered this in detail in today's main room chat as far as itb and even visa and as i see it we could see everything being kind of way down and i would say that the opportunity is in consumer staples utilities healthcare, the core defensive sectors but we do know if interest rates are remaining high but that's not enough to fight inflation if inflation inflation is still higher and bond prices are selling off then probably the opportunity is going to be in gold gold silver and even commodities finding a base gold has made this lovely run up from about 1820 to 2020 and so there's almost a 200 point run up now this is either just a pullback a bounce off the previous resistance as new support or higher highs higher lows and we could just drift from current price back up to retest these highs which is a very strong barrier and that's a great trade anyway but it could also be this massive bull flag and if it's a massive bull flag we could be looking at a 200 point move higher above say 1970 so could we be looking at 2170 could we be looking at a massive move to a multi-year high if inflation is not in check and we're going to see the fed not raise rates with today's statement, we can, should expect gold to start hedging that out and we could be looking at a multi-year high. Now that is not to say that we should expect all metals to go higher. I'm just talking about inflation hedge because copper is my demand indicator and you can see it is rolled back down and likely heading back down to these lows through here. If manufacturing and demand is lower, copper will likely slide back down to retest its recent lows but gold could continue to rise as a precious metal and a hedge against inflation the last thing i'm going to throw out is the idea of discretionary spending versus less than discretionary spending what i mean by that is let's make a quick comparison between abercrombie finch and tj maxx companies so we're talking about the discount clothes retail versus the more expensive one like abercrombie fitch so Abercrombie Fitch just reached a record high today and sold off pretty aggressively. We have earnings coming up. It's highly overbought. And this is where I'll agree with the professor on some of the high, high prices that have been in Abercrombie Fitch. But let's take a look at TJ Maxx. Here is TJX. TJ Maxx has held here, not really climbing to new record highs, but kind of held here and have been pretty consistent as far as what they earn. It's not just that I'm betting on TJ Maxx. I'm going to bet against a and F. So if we take TJX and subtract out, meaning we'll be selling two times, well, let's just go ahead and sell one times, one times A and F. The idea here is we'd be looking for a bounce. And if we see a bounce here and we're just buying TJ Maxx and selling Abercrombie, then a bounce here at 24 could go to 35, could go up here to 42. I think that is a reasonable target. And we could be looking at a Paris trade, selling the high end, buying the discount brand as we go into this tighter economic conditions. And we're talking about a recovery, a move up of about 50% to 100% over the next two months. Well, that's going to do it for me today. Have a great day. We'll look forward to talking to you again next week.